Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Samuel Adams Returns. Those anti-federalists absolutely got it correct. And this is Tom Novolis, your host and our guest today. And he's smiling there because he's heard this introduction many times is none other than Gordon Dakota Arnold Cody. Uh, and I have uh, developed a relationship over the last couple of years, and I am delighted to uh, bring to you him being a new assistant professor of politics at Colorado Christian University. So, Cody, it's just an honor and delight to have you on this program. Uh, after all this time, we really have now the opportunity to connect. But, hey, the listeners don't know anything about you. So uh, how about uh, just a little bit on your background, a little introduction, if you would, please. Well, I'm delighted to be here, Tom. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm originally from North Carolina, the Greensboro High Point area. That's where I was uh, born and raised and spent most of my life. Um, I went to college at Regent University in Virginia Beach, and that was the first time out of the state for a lengthy period of time. I majored in government and minored in history, and it was really at Regent that I believe that I came into my own as someone that really cared deeply about the founding fathers and about American political history. And it was it was there, I think, where the seeds were planted for the direction I would go in my career, thanks to some wonderful teachers I had at that time. Uh, I spent time at the John Jay Institute right after graduation, which is in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And that was a amazing experience. I got to go to Independence Hall and spend some time at wonderful founding sites while I was at John Jay. And of course, it was shortly thereafter that I made my way to Hillsdale College, where I'm currently a PhD candidate, trying to finish my doctoral dissertation and get my degree wrapped up. So excellent about me, Tom. Yeah, excellent. You know, and then just that great opportunity, too, that uh, recently a new uh, assistant professor there. So that's exciting getting uh, on all of that. So what really draw my attentions for for everybody for this program was an article that uh, Cody wrote that just blew me away. And, and because it will take, and for all my Federalist friends, because I, I had some Federalist friends, Cody, that I talked to about this article, and they're going, wait a minute, we're Federalists, and you're just anti-Federalist guy. I said, wait a minute, I'm a balanced guy, you know? I mean, I love the anti-Federalists because they were so predictive, but at the same time, the construct of federalism and what that really means and, and those that could bring it together in, in those principles, I'm all about that. That's what we should have. But yet, you know, there's some guys that sometimes I wonder if they're not Hamiltonian, you know, from a consolidated government perspective versus truly understanding uh, federalism in, in the context. And that we'll we'll talk about some of uh, your insights to a, a federalist that I never paid attention to that you're doing your dissertation on. Uh, that's pretty exciting. But, folks, this article blew me away. And the title of this article is James Madison's Radical Aversion to Christian Politics in America. Cody, what, I mean, what prompted you to even write this article? What, what brought you there? Madison has been a pet project of mine for some time. You know, I think the very, um, I think that early in my study of the founding, you start reading the notes of the convention, you start reading about the development of the Constitution and the ideas behind it. And of course, Madison is a key player in this. Right. You know, people call him, I think, unjustly, very unjustly, they call him simply the father of the Constitution, as if the Constitution just floated out of the brain of James Madison or something. But, um, you know, I think that my study of the convention showed me that Madison really espoused all kinds of ideas that many of the other framers did not accept, you know, regarding consolidation and regarding the role of the states in the system. And I think it was from that general suspicion of Madison that I've always had his, uh, I, I would say, radical individualism in many respects that is on display at the convention uh, that made me study his religious ideas. And I eventually just came to believe that in some respects, he's 
he's either ad, he's either as radical but arguably more radical than Thomas Jefferson in the <laughs> critique that he mounts of Christian politics. So he's a uh, he's a founder I've spent a lot of time with. I think mostly because I sort of grow weary of the myths that surround him as being just the architect of our system, the father of the Constitution and whatnot, as if, you know, he was the only indispensable figure in the drafting of this document. No, I appreciate that because, you know, I took Madison because I'm, I was so focused uh, and still am to, in, in much regard, Sam Adams and then, you know, the, the, especially the New England a uh, whole cadre of uh, early founders, even, you know, from that early period uh, all the way through, which is, I recall, I'm gonna put a plug in for you here. You you actually have relatives that go back to the Mayflower. So uh, you can talk to that in a moment as well. But the, the point being is that when I looked at Madison, I, I took a flush on him, you know, remonstrances uh, was also one that I always had an issue with. But, uh, you know, I didn't peg it uh, to the level that you brought out in this article. How about give a survey of this, because there's a few points in here during the course of, of this program that I want to bring out. But survey for me uh, the ideas of because Madison, when I dug into this, it blew my mind. It really set set me on fire to dig deeper, especially in those Virginia guys. I mean, not only Madison, but we, look at George Mason walking away from the convention in, in its final signatory uh, position. And yet he was the one that kind of edged Madison into, from your writing, edged him into taking and and writing uh, memorial and, and remonstrances. So please survey the, the article that you did. Yeah, so I'm very glad you brought up the Memorial and Remonstrance because, you know, that I think is an article that it's very easy to read it. And you might have an idea of Madison as being, I think, a little more moderate than he is, you know, because Madison, he goes out of his way in this particular essay, uh, you know, to open by saying, well, you know, this religious disestablishment policy that I favor, it's actually good for the church. You know, here's why if the state is allowing its tax money to go to these preachers and maybe they won't work so hard to spread the gospel. And so there are all kinds of ways in that particular essay where Madison, I think, is trying to placate a Christian audience into supporting his particular agenda so far as religious disestablishment goes. And of course, in fairness to him, many good Christian people did, many Baptists, many Presbyterians that were unhappy with the Anglican establishment you know, they ultimately did work with them. But I think that the heart of that document is not necessarily this argument that Christians will be better off if they disestablish religion. It's really found in some of the ideas that Madison expresses about equality and about equal rights and how, you know, he says that it's fundamentally tyrannical for any kind of tax money, any kind of political support of religion. Uh, if you have yeah. that, you're violating the the rights of unbelievers of all kinds. And so we're supposed to believe that Patrick Henry and Sam Adams and George Washington and others that favored a kind of moderate Christian establishment, you know, that was a evil, tyrannical violation of rights, according to Madison. And so I think that you get a better impression of what that document means if you read Madison's later text, The Detached Memoranda, which I talk at length about yes. in this article. You know, this is where Madison says that uh, he actually attacks George Washington for his customary practice of delivering Thanksgiving proclamations. You know, like Thanksgiving proclamations, according to Madison, are unjust because it assumes that we as a people believe in a providential God that, you know, rules over us. And Madison says that even that, uh, even if you don't mention Jesus, as Washington didn't, even if you just have that kind of broad invocation of religion at the state level, Madison says it sanctions the erroneous idea of a national church. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Madison's ultimate goal was not, I think, you know, simply a kind of moderate separation of church and state in order to help the gospel spread. I think that his his real end game was the kind of exile of Christianity from political life in a very deep way. 
And, and we see that today. I mean, it, so what I like is that, you know, the way that you approach this and the way that you kind of give that shock right at the beginning uh, of, wait a minute, Madison wasn't everything that everybody thinks he was cut out to be in that perspective. And the real uh, heartbreak for many, if you will, is that Madison, who was his mentor almost, Witherspoon. Mm -hmm. Now, Witherspoon, he, he was the epitome of the combination of church and state based on everything, you know, he spent time with. And I love the way that you do that introduction of that relationship. But then it seems like in uh, his second or third year at Princeton, he takes and he goes off haywire, spends more time in Locke. And when we understand Locke is, you know, give a little definition on that, because if we look at uh, uh, common, not common, Locke, but uh, just the ideas of Locke, boy, Madison got hung up in the wrong place. And then what did he do? Voltaire was another one he was on. So give us a little bit more on that. Yeah, so the interest in Locke that Madison had, you know, it was uh, very much characteristic of the founding to be interested in the Whig mm -hmm. authors, and Locke was one of these important Whig authors. But I think that what sets Madison apart is that he's not simply drawing from the kind of broad Lockean ideas of government by consent and, you know, government that protects the rights of individuals. You know, very few founders, including Sam Adams and other great Christian founders, they would not necessarily question that, I think. But what sets Madison apart is that his study of Locke reached so deep that he's focused on Locke's epistemological writings, yeah. you know, things like the essay concerning human understanding, things like the religious essays. Um, you know, the famous letter concerning toleration. And it's in these essays that I think that Locke's skepticism uh, comes out. You know, Locke is uh, someone that basically makes the case that we can't really believe we can't really be certain that any one religious position is true. You know, like it might be the case that there's some vague use of Christian morality, but you know, these doctrinaire people that run around, speaking as if original sin and the Trinity are these kinds of absolute doctrines that we can rationally prove. Locke is very skeptical of that and attacks it very fiercely. And Madison very much draws from that. He draws from the epistemological skepticism. You know, he's very much convinced, like Locke, that we can't really know for sure what religion is true or not. And that's why we have to have this absolute separation of church and state. That's why Christianity should not be allowed to have any kind of political support, uh, you know, because it's out of that uncertainty that arises this emphasis on equality, you know, because if Christianity is uh, in, if Christianity is not any more rational than something like deism or even Islam, you know, there's no reason that it should be given any more political support. Right. So, yeah. And, and just his whole denial of the Trinity, then, you know, to take and follow, as you said, uh, the epistemological perspective is like, my goodness, I, I, here's a guy that was. But, you know, when I started looking at uh, I, I, his or, original now, he was uh, Anglican raised, correct? So when you start looking at that, and then Mason was an Episcopalian, so that's like, you know, bread and butter right there. And so you start seeing some of that shifts, and they're not grounded like the Puritans were grounded or the Presbyterians were grounded. And uh, that takes and makes a big difference. Well, we're down to that last few seconds here, and it goes so fast, doesn't it? It's amazing here how we go. But folks, when you, you come into the next segment, some of what we're going to talk about is the shock of how uh, Madison said, you know, how can you even uh, see that there is a God? As Cody was already inferring was, is that where is the reason? How do you prove it? And that's what he set Madison set up, not Cody, he being Madison set up for our present time. When we take and we look at the political environment, we start asking ourselves why, and then Christians and even just you know some conservatives in general go, Well, why is it such a you know, Christian walks into work in government and yet there's this disconnect 
Well, Madison established that, but not like Sam Adams. You see, Sam Adams carried his forward. So when we come back in the second segment, we'll carry forward. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second segment of Samuel Adams Returns, those anti-federalists. Yep, they predictably got it correct. Tom Navola is here again with my guest is Cody Arnold. We're having a good time. Cody's bringing insights into Madison that I'm telling you, there's other authors that uh, you can talk about here because you sourced. And I was re I don't read a lot of modern authors, but uh, obviously you really captured some of them. I'm digging into a few. It's just because I don't trust them, Cody. They 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 go down all these different paths. But, you know, it seems to me that there's some that are really you know, capturing it and you found them. So in that sourcing Oh, how did that come together for you in uh, some of the sources of these other authors that were able to help solidify uh, your research as well? Yeah, I think that the scholarship on Madison's religious beliefs, you know, it's um, there. there's a lot on it, but there's uh, just not a lot that is very in-depth and detailed, just because, as one scholar said, I think it was James Hudson, he wrote that... When you read Madison's corpus and you're looking for religious information, it's like peering into a void is how he puts it, you know, because Madison speaks so rarely and so little about just what his doctrines are, you know, and so you really have to like piece it together using a few select letters, some of his public documents and, uh, you know, things where you actually do get hints of what his religious beliefs were. Um, some scholars, I think, move in the direction of tr basically, I think, making arguments from silence where they say, well, Madison, um, his letters don't explicitly disparage the Trinity or the resurrection. So he's actually an Anglican. He's actually a real Christian, you know, like uh, Emmy Bradford, for example, he just sort of lists him casually as an as an Anglican believer in his uh, book on the founding. And I think that that's a mistake because denominational affiliation doesn't necessarily prove religious conviction or sincere religious conviction. I mean, think of how Jefferson was a vestryman in his church for quite a long time. Uh, you know, like there were kind of social reasons that some of these people might be members of Correct. a particular denomination that didn't entail real assent to Orthodox Trinitarian or Christian beliefs. So I think that some scholars have I think rightly identify that Madison's views are probably not in step with the Christian faith, but there's just not a lot that's said about it. And I think that in many ways it's because a lot of scholars buy into this sort of lock Madison assumption that reason and faith are these completely separated things. And so we can really get into Madison's politics without trying to understand the theological foundation for his politics. True. So. And, and so, you know, bringing that ahead to now and continuing how we were closing out the last segment is that when we look at how the court uh, look observes and then uh, adjudicates on different issues, uh, they obviously are referencing the historical perspective. Uh, there are a couple other founders that we'll talk about momentarily in uh, that you bring out in a different article. The Connecticut connection is what I like calling it now, is that it, what we're seeing is those aren't necessarily referenced, but to the point as you open the conversation with Madison is looked at as that, you know, Sam Adams is the father of the American Revolution. So, too, is Madison the father of the Constitution. Therefore, he's the most highly referenced. But that is a mistake in so many ways. You want to elaborate on some of that as it looks at our present time and uh, the court climate to start with? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, there, there are these uh, series of decisions that the court made, you know, around the time of the Warren court era and following where they really were militant about imposing this very, very strict wall of separation. And they actually take that language from Jefferson's famous letter to the Danbury Baptists. Mm -hmm. And they say, this is what the Constitution means. And they point to a few quotes from Jefferson and also Madison to say, well, the framers meant that we should have no 
religion in public schools. We should have no public support for religion. And there's very much a reliance on Madison to make these kinds of arguments. But that just radically skews our understanding of what the constitutional consensus of the founding was. You know, uh, a, a teacher that I have here at Hillsdale by the name, name of Dr. Thomas West, he likes to stress that Madison and Jefferson were very unusual in the founding generation because of this deep skepticism of public support for religion. You know, Washington didn't have that position. John Adams, who was not himself a believer, he still was not quite as strict as Jefferson or Madison might be. And you just go down the list, Sam Adams, Pat, uh, Richard Henry Lee, uh, you know, all kinds of founders would reject these school prayer decisions. And it comes out in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that was actually ratified. You know, the federal government did not have any authority to shut down the religious establishments of the various states. And this is actually despite Madison's efforts at the convention. You know, some scholars have thought that one of the key reasons that he wanted this powerful central government that has a national veto over state laws is because of the great difficulty by which he struggled to get religious freedom through in Virginia. And so some scholars have speculated that by designing a central government, which would potentially have an, an incorporated right to freedom of religion against the states, you could basically impose this kind of strict separation of church and state throughout the nation. But the Bill of Rights that was drafted, um, you know, people like Roger Sherman, they actually mm -hmm. cut out Madison's language, yeah. which would have given the federal government the power to protect freedom of religion throughout the nation. And that was the Bill of Rights that was actually laid down. It was actually more about protecting the right of states to handle religion for themselves than it was about giving the federal government the power to step in and shut down prayer in school or to interfere in any way with the way states handled religious policy. True. And then we see that, you know, carrying even as we you know just discussed right here in the courts and the courts then utilizing that. And uh, I always laugh at a lot of the young uh, clerks, if you will, that go to uh, the, the Supreme Court and get the opportunity to clerk there. They uh, take and are referencing this. Some are balanced, but a lot of them reference out into just those frameworks that you just established. But then when we look at the political landscape, and we're seeing all through that, uh, as you have heard me say a lot of times, is that the churches haven't done their job, which the assumption then would be truly if Madison's ideas of that separation and Jefferson's that uh, giving the pastors more time for their flocks, we would have had more people that would have been the virtuous that would be able to then govern appropriately under uh, the Constitution, as even Madison and then uh, John Adams said, we need, what, a moral and virtuous people or moral religious, depending on how some people read it. Mm -hmm. We didn't get that. And based on Madison's ideas, we were never going to get that because of the way he established that secularism all the way into the almost uh, every nuance of uh, the political environment. So how would, uh, how do you think, and from what you kind of summarize a little bit, how do you think that Madison was thinking of uh getting these folks in there. I mean, how would he have moral and virtuous? Because he didn't like piety. He didn't like religion. So what's your thoughts? Yeah, you know, well, I mean, uh, Madison in his letter to William Bradford, he says that mm -hmm. religious bondage shackles the mind and unfits it for every noble enterprise and every expanded prospect. And in a letter to Thomas Jefferson, which I cite in that essay, uh, you know, he he suggests that religion is ultimately a kind of um, passion. You know, it's not something that's grounded in reason, really. It's something that people accept on faith and they kind of gravitate to their little religious groups and, you know, try to influence political life in that way. But according to Madison, that can create a majority faction. You know, that's a threat to the rights of individuals. And so Madison's views, I think, on virtue should be understood less through a lens of the kind of John Adams, Sam Adams, more uh, uh, his his idea of virtue, I don't think 
stresses religiosity as being fundamental to virtue. You know, like I think that he he does believe that there's utility in the belief in God. Um, you know, I think that he believes that the ethics of Jesus, very much like Jefferson, I think if you asked him, he'd say that the ethics of Jesus are the the best ethics for a Republican people. But what he dislikes about Christianity is its doctrinalism, you know, its tendency towards dogma. And those dogmas create these majority factions that we need to be very wary of. And so his idea of virtue, I think, is less about, you know, sincere Christian piety. And it's more a kind of a, you know, I hate to use the word Machiavellian in reference to him, but it is a kind of a, a, vir a virtue in the sense of, you know, citizens who are willing to step up and do what's necessary to defend their rights and their liberty, you know, and so it's a more civic conception of virtue rather than something that's really deeply Calvinistic. So if we're taking in, you know, you're taking everything you said, and I want the, the listeners or, and the viewers to really capture that, even if they have to go back and replay it, because that is what we're seeing there. I mean, we have a lot of us that'll say, oh, the, you know, they're all the left is all a bunch of communists. They're this, they're that, they're all of this. But then I had to really pay attention in this article and think that through, especially with what you just said, is that when these folks don't I identify themselves with those other terms, because in their minds and their hearts, they can align with Madison and Jefferson and say, look, this is where these guys were at. And this is that total separation of our, our civics and, and religiosity. And you know what? All you Christian conservatives and all you others, so-called conservatives, you're, you are troublesome because— of how'd you just define that, that that Madison said? He he wraps that together and go ahead and finish my thought. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the dog the dogmatism, you know, the way that right. Christians are united in a kind of a passion that incentivizes them to seize control of the levers of the state and use it to privilege their sect or their denomination, even at the expense of the whole society of you know people who don't believe so let and, me interrupt you in that one because that's what madison wanted was that separation within christianity you brought that out in the article which was I intriguing to me that that's what we have today we don't see uh, denominations actually even come together on single issues like abortion or or several mm -hmm. of the others what's your thought on that oh yeah i mean i i think that that was one of uh, my favorite points of this article I wrote was the difference between Madison and George Washington on that point. You know, Washington and his letters to the Christian denominations, he talks about how the harmony and the brotherly love between the clergy of the different denominations is one of the reasons that we know as a society that religion and morality are the foundations for our, our community. Whereas Madison, he actually praises the discord and hatred of the Christian sects. You know, he says that the hatred of the Christian sects has been inflamed against one another, and I am very far from deploring this because it is the only safeguard of our religious rights. And this comes across also in Federalist 51, where Madison says that the multiplicity of sects and denominations is the very reason that we can be confident that the rights of individuals will be protected against the sort of uh, Christian nationalist types that try to unite and, you know, seize control of the state, you know, and so Madison likes the church to be splintered and divided. He gets this from Voltaire. That's a Voltairean rooted idea. There you go. And it's that division in the church, which, you know, kind of pacifies us and it makes us accept toleration as the lowest common denominator, you know, basically. Yeah. So, yeah, whereas when we look at, you know, many of the others, especially as uh, we'll talk about in, in the uh, next segment a little bit, are some of those uh, left, I, I'll call them the left beyond Sam Adams, because they live longer than him, Puritans, if you will, that they 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 were contemporaries even within uh, the convention and, and very much had impacts into its success 
whereas Madison uh, didn't particularly care for some of those ideas that came from the Connecticut connection. Well, folks, come on back in the third segment. It's really interesting, and I hope it's really causing you to think with Cody here in, in this article. But Sam Adams, he had it right. Those anti-federalists, boy, you know what? We have a proof case for them now, Cody. See you next moment. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this last segment of Samuel Adams Returns with my fabulous guest today, none other than, uh, I call just Cody Arnold. He's great. You know, he, go back to the first segment if you want all his bio. We got too much to cover right now. And in fact, uh, we're laughing right now because we were having a, a conversation in the break here and uh, Cody goes, I go, hey, we're, I'm getting ready to record. And he's going, well, wait a minute. I thought we were recording all this time. <laughs> but the, the, the reason that we're really enjoying this is because we do want to talk uh, about uh, his dissertation. And he is doing a great paper and work on uh, a former senator uh, from Massachusetts that we'll delve into. His name, Cody, throw it out there. Go ahead. Henry Cabot Lodge Sr., not to be confused with his grandson of the same name, who was kind of a Rockefeller Republican rhino type during the 60s. Um, but the original Henry Cabot Lodge was a uh, constitutional conservative um, who defended, uh, very, very passionately defended the Senate against the progressives. And he believed that the Senate was essentially a Puritan institution. It was an institution whose roots were in the New England communities and their dedication to self-government. And he saw it as significant that the Senate's design was really facilitated by Oliver Ellsworth and Roger Sherman above all others at the convention. You know, sons of New England, you could call them Puritans of a kind. And, you know, to lodge Sherman and Ellsworth are really the heroes of the Constitutional Convention who helped to give the Constitution this deeply federal states' rights character. I think that Sherman and Ellsworth are very helpful because they show us that the Federalist Party label, you know, it's a mistake to look at Madison and be like, well, that's what all the Federalists were about, you know, because certainly Sherman and Ellsworth were deeply dedicated yes. to a state's rights republic of enumerated powers. They didn't agree with the anti-feds in that they believed the Constitution protected the rights of the states, and so they wanted to ratify it. You know, But they also had views about the relationship between religion and politics that were very traditionally minded, very Puritan. You know, They liked their established churches in Connecticut, although they might not want the federal government involved in enacting any kind of sweeping religious policies and that was that was just because they knew that these things should be handled at the state level you know yeah. and so sherman and ellsworth give us a broader picture understanding of what the federalists were all about you know madison he started out as a federalist and that he's pro-constitution but he becomes a republican you know and so he's kind of in a sect on all into himself because he is very much a consolidationist at the time of the convention, wants the Constitution for that reason. But then he rejects the Federalist Party later on and allies with Jefferson. So he's he's heterodox in so many ways, not just religiously. Yeah. So and that's the real you know comparison and contrast as we take and we look at, you know, in that conclusions that you have on Madison. And, and it's amazing that he gets this um, tagline, this moniker, if you will. And yet, when we look at the other players in the Constitution, if it was not for Sherman and Ellsworth, as I reflected, looked, went, you know, went again, refreshed myself in the debates and then some of their writings, if those two didn't step up the way they did, you know, it, it would have been totally different. And I don't think it would have ever come to any conclusion because the small states mm -hmm. would have just totally rejected uh, anything that was coming out of uh, it, the convention. So finish up then. What, what's the conclusion? And then I want to revert back to those guys a little bit. But let's finish up on Madison. And in particular, for all my strong Federalist friends out there, 
<laughs> I have fun with them all the time. They love me. Uh, we we do. But uh, the the whole idea of that is is that uh, truly, you you can say Madison wasn't just anti Christian. He was anti uh, morality in government in today's sense of things. Back then, he thought that, as you explained in the last segment, that that virtue, that humanistic virtue uh, could exist. But we know without any religious establishment, without any God in us and in life, uh, not going to get there. So with that, help me out, Cody. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think that Madison, um, you know, like it's hard to know exactly like if he was alive today, what would his stance be on insert moral issue here, abortion, gay marriage, whatnot. I mean, it's it's possible that he could argue from, uh, you know, maybe utilitarian uh, reasons against these things, you know, like some founders often stress how marriage is good for society. And, you know, so it's possible maybe even likely that madison would not necessarily be a wokester if he were alive today i mean i would like to believe he has enough sense to reject that but on the other hand utilitarianism is such a feeble foundation for any kind of real moral uh robust case for christian morality because if it's just the standard of utility uh the greatest good for the greatest number or whatever maximizes the pleasure of all the individuals in society uh once you strip the bible and revelation and christian uh, doctrine out of these moral considerations what are you left with as your foundation you know and so i i definitely think that madison's agenda um the the great threat is this separation of faith and reason that's really what he gets wrong at the most fundamental core level you know he thinks that those two realms are completely separated religion is a passion um it's not really rational and someone like jonathan edwards and from the roman catholic perspective thomas aquinas you know these two people would strongly attack that idea you know they Mm -hmm. believe that uh, as jonathan edwards puts it you know religion is uh the the ruling element of of uh our rational soul and so like once you don't have that religious faith your reason isn't perfected and so madison at the core level in stripping reason and faith and their deep connection uh he follows along with Locke in doing that and that's really i think the core problem for us today is that we've taken religion out of government because we don't believe that it's rational we don't believe that it's you know, it, it might be your private belief, but it's really just an opinion. It's not something that you can have any measure of confidence about. Um, you know, it's you you have just as much certainty about your Christian beliefs as everyone else does about their own beliefs. And so religion is just confined to private life and needs to get out of the way of politics. So, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's what the, the, that's the nut of our modern society right there that's well defined it it just well articulated where everybody is you know good portion of the uh, non-christian involvement is at and so the universities for the most part that's where the professors are at now it was very interesting as i was reviewing that not only what you had in, in your article on madison and then in education and what he and and both jefferson uh, we're looking at from an educational perspective. Uh, touch on that just for a moment, if you would, because that made a big difference in what transitions happen from the early educational philosophy, even at Princeton, to the present. And they were very, and Madison and, and uh, Jefferson were probably the two most influential people uh in that uh uh, thinking and and philosophy yeah you know um some members of the federalist party when jefferson was running for president they believed that if we elect this guy we're going to have to hide our bibles because he's going to come into our homes and he's going to seize our bibles and take them out of all the schools and you know that was a 
a genuine concern, which, of course, that wasn't exactly lived out by history. You know, Jefferson was responsible enough not to do anything like that. But it did reflect this, I think, understanding on the part of some Federalist leaders that the ideas that they're expressing and the educational philosophy they're advancing, there's not really much room for Christianity in it other than just uh, maybe a vague God, you know, like, I mean, Jefferson's famous Morals and Ethics of Jesus book, where he cuts out all the miracles and uh, the testimony of scripture to anything supernatural, and he just reduces it to Jesus's moral teachings, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so Madison and Jefferson would be comfortable with you know, sort of educating people to the ethics of Christ, but they would stop uh, very strongly at educating them to believe in the truth of Christianity, you know, like to the extent that religion was taught at the University of Virginia, which Jefferson established, like it was taught as just another field, you know, Jefferson thought it was very important that the center of the campus should be a library rather than a church, as was the case at Yale and Harvard. You know, like, and he he thought that that architectural principle reflected the belief that reason is the yes. center of our education, not religion. And so, religion is taught, but it's taught by Unitarians and even Deists, and it's taught, you know, simply as just something people believe um, without any reference to truth. So, exactly, very much a problematic educational philosophy, right? I mean, uh, you can see the seeds of later developments from people like John Dewey and Horace Mann, you know, in that particular uh, understanding. Absolutely. And so that kind of brings us then a little bit back to uh, Ellsworth and Sherman and uh, establishing what I call the, the greater compromise and what they were able to do and bringing the Senate to bear. And as you said, that was more of a Puritan philosophical perspective than anything else. We're down to about three minutes, Cody, so I'm going to give you some time. But folks, I want you to, uh, in, in the uh, program uh, blog there at samueladamsreturns.net for today, I have both articles, the first one that we're talking about with Madison, and then a second one uh, that Cody wrote on uh, on the filibuster by uh, Lodge. And let's talk about that for a minute, because when we look at the structure of the Senate, the destruction of it uh, by the 17th Amendment, but give me just that snapshot, because we're down to like two minutes uh, in, in that article. So yeah, promo so that. So at the convention, you have this big debate between the consolidationists and the states' rights people, and Sherman and Ellsworth are firmly on the side of the states in this debate. You know, they're very concerned about this effort to, uh, you know, Madison's famous Virginia plan, you know, create a federal government that doesn't op that doesn't uh, have any uh, role for the states to play in the selection of its officers, and that it has a national veto over all the state legislation. Um, Ellsworth and Sherman, in contrast, they very much believed that if you don't have the state legislatures select the upper house, then you can kiss federalism goodbye. You know, like that is the institutional protection for the rights of the states. You know, like it, and so they very much liked the equality of the states in the Senate. They liked the selection of senators by state legislatures because these ensured that this was not going to be a consolidated government. It was going to be a genuinely federal system. And so they were capital F Federalists as members of the Federalist Party, but they were also lowercase f Federalists. You know, they also believed in the prestige of the states and wanted to preserve it in our system. Yes, absolutely. And uh, folks, it was a great article that, as I mentioned, Cody does that Lodge uh, penned and Cody uh, takes and brings into the sense on the whole idea of the filibuster. That's in debate right now. Again, uh, we're down to one minute left. I'll give you 30 seconds, Cody. Go ahead and tell us whatever you want to say in this next 30 seconds. OK, well, uh, just on the filibuster specifically, I should point out that the reason Henry Cabot Lodge defends it, this essay of mine is about Lodge and his defense of the filibuster in the Senate. And he connects the filibuster to the overarching structural design of the Senate as an institution. You know, the Senate was designed 
to protect minorities and small states from overbearing majorities of the whole nation, you know, and so it was a safeguard against the tyranny of the majority. Well, I mean, the filibuster reflects that same dedication to consensus and deliberation and considering minorities because it allows minorities in the Senate to defend their positions and it ensures okay. that you need a lot of consensus to actually yes. do the thing. Good. And folks, you're going to have to come on back and pay attention when Cody's coming back because Sam Adams will come back next week. See you then. Thanks so much, Tom. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah.